Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege of prayer. I pray, dear Father, that you would please forgive me of my sins and that you would cleanse me from my unrighteousness. I pray, dear Father, that you would please be with my church family here as we have come before you, not to hear the words of a man or men, but to hear the words of heaven. The purpose of these two weeks is for revival and reformation. And we are told very clearly that the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs is a revival and a reformation. And to see this should not be our second, third, or fourth work, but that it should be our first work. And we pray, dear Father, that you would please forgive us for, for putting everything else before this. And especially upon this evening, the Sabbath, we pray for a double portion of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would awaken us out of the spiritual lethargy to which it is so easy for us to become accustomed to. And I just pray that you would give us newness of life, be with those who are on their way, be with our online audience as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in light of that, this is just a quick little interject, as we mentioned before. If you have a cell phone, please either put it on silent or kindly turn it off, as we do not want the enemy to unduly interrupt what the Lord is seeking to do. Amen? Amen. Now, in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 11. The Bible says, now all these things happen unto them for what? And that in samples, that's another word for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are what? Now, were the ends of the world coming upon the Apostle Paul when he wrote this? No, they weren't. Were they coming upon any other uh, person living in any other time period before ours? No, it's talking about specifically this generation. Verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he do what? Lest he fall. It says, There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to what? Amen. Common to man. But God is unfaithful. Amen. He's faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to do what? That ye may be able to bear it. Now, what group of people was the Apostle Paul referring to in these texts? Yes, the children of Israel. So all of these things that happened, he was specifically talking about the children of Israel. Now, what is the theme or the title of this two-week Revival and Reformation series? The Closing Captivity. Now, the Closing Captivity, who is that referring to? What time period of, of Israel's history is that referring to? Yes, their, their eventual exodus from that Medo-Persian realm as they were going back to Jerusalem to rebuild God's holy city. Rebuild God's holy city. Now, we have been going through this week, unfortunately, some of the things that directly led to them going into captivity. Now, again, in light of this reality, do you think that it's good for us to understand specifically why they had to go in into captivity in the first place? That's very important before we study them actually leaving. Now, as we take a look at the screen, this is our uh, theme uh, text. It says, many are casting contempt upon the Old Testament scriptures, but these are not to lose their what? Their sacredness. Throughout all time, they are not to be dropped out of our instruction. Paul writes concerning the experiences of God's people in ancient times, and we just read that. The prophets spoke less for their own time than for the ages which have followed and for our own day. So again, we saw very clearly that these prophecies and all of these things that God gave to these ancient prophets were specifically talking about those of us living here at the end of time. 
All right, now does everybody remember this? Now, what is this referring to? What is this referring to? Yes, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 15. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 16, rather. Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, we're going to notice what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 16, we're going to start in verse 1. And when you have it, you can say amen. It says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the what? To the full. So do you think that they were engaging in gluttony? Yes. Yes. Now is gluttony good for the body? No. No, it's not. For ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with what? With hunger. Now, in in light of all of the miracles that God had done for ancient Israel, do you think that it was ridiculous that they were saying that God brought them into the wilderness to kill them? Brothers and sisters, this is what sin does to the mind. And many times we look at these experiences of ancient Israel and we would say, if we were living during that time, we would never engage in this mermaid complaining. We would never say the, the, the incredible Uh, fallacies that the children of Israel used to engage in, but unfortunately, without the grace of God, we would do the same exact thing. Or even worse, it says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for what? For you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may do what for them? May prove them. You see, one of the principles that you continually see through the sacred writings of God and the spirit of prophecy is this reality that God is always proving us. Now, why is God so intent upon proving us? Develop our characters, love. Now, what is the ultimate goal? What is the ultimate goal? Full salvation. Not just an initial surrendering to God, but for us to be finally saved in heaven. Now, was God going to permit sin to enter heaven again? No, he's not. So in order for that to happen, we on this earth have to be proved. Now, what do we have to prove? We have to prove that we love Jesus so much that we would rather die than commit sin. Now, do you think that that is a serious spiritual condition to get into? Yes, it is. And if we really understood how serious it is, we would take things very differently from how we do. Now, in light of what we're talking about, do you think that what we eat plays a great deal of factor into this? Yes, it does. It says, and it shall come to pass, this is verse 5, that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of what? Of Egypt. It says, And in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for he that for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and that and what are we that ye murmur against what? Now why was he saying, Why are we that you murmur against us? Why is he saying that? Because we weren't the ones that brought you out of Egypt. We are not responsible for this great deliverance. You should not be murmuring against us. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to uh, the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the what? This is the same thing that God told Samuel. They're not doing against you, this against you, but they're really doing this against me. It says, And Moses spake unto Aaron, and say, uh, uh, say unto the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, 
for the uh, for he hath heard your what? For he hath heard your murmurings. So again, on Wednesday we saw some of this. This is a symbol of ancient Egypt. Unfortunately, this was some of the reality of what was going on. What did the ancient Egyptians really eat? This is all just a means of review. They drank a lot of beer. Now, is, is beer good for our physical health? No, it's not. Now, some person will say, well, a little, a little wine is good for you. Now, does the Bible say that a little wine is good for you? Yes, it does. It says that a little wine is good for the belly, but is it talking about fermented wine? No, it's not. It's talking about the new wine of the cluster, which is merely just grape juice. Yes, it says, if you were rich, you had a choice of treats. Egyptian mummies diagnosed with clogged what? Clogged arteries. So they suffered from many of the same things. Diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, all of this. All right, skipping past. Earliest case of scurvy in ancient Egypt detected by archaeologists. Skipping past, it says, in Egypt, their taste had become what? Perverted. You see, we have to realize that much of our tastes have become perverted. So if it has become perverted, what do you think has to happen to it? It has to be unperverted. Unperverted. God designed to restore their appetite to a pure, healthy state in order that they might enjoy the simple what? Did that say the simple uh, chicken wings? The simple fruits. The simple fruits. That were given to Adam and Eve in Eden. He was about to establish them in a second Eden. He purposed to remove the feverish diet upon which they had substituted in Egypt. I subsisted, thank you. For he wished them to be in perfect health and soundness so that the surrounding heathen nations might be constrained to glorify the God of what? So even by how they ate, the heathen surrounding them were to be convinced that they were worshiping the true God. Do you know that we're told in 1 Kings, actually, let's read it. Let's turn it up to the book of 1 Kings. Let's turn it up to the book of 1 Kings chapter 10. We're going to notice what the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 10. First Kings chapter 10. First Kings chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 3. The Bible says, And Solomon told her all her questions. Now, who is this her that the Bible is referring to? The Queen of Sheba. It says, There was not anything uh, hid from the king which he told her not. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had what? Speaking of the house of God, and the meat of his what? And the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more what in her? There was no more spirit. So part of the, the, the means that the Queen of Sheba was so convinced that the God of Solomon was the true God was by what he ate at his table. Now, do you think that there is any lesson in that experience? Yes, it is. It says, unless the people who acknowledged him as the God of heaven were in perfect soundness of what? Now, again, perfect soundness of health. You know, God would actually have it that there would not be one Seventh-day Adventist church that, what, that had any case of cancer, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, none of it. But unfortunately, is that the, our current condition in this day and age? No, it is not, unfortunately. Again, there must be a revival and a reformation. This says, if the Israelites had been given the diet to which they had been accustomed while in Egypt, they would have exhibited the unmanageable spirit that the world is exhibiting today. Again, is the world unmanageable? Yes, it is. All righty. Now, everybody remember this. This is just a symbol of health, an overall symbol of health. This says, from the beginning of the health reform work, we have found it necessary to educate, educate, educate. God desires us to continue this work of educating the what? 
educating the people. Now, in light of that, who here by show of hands feels that they need more education? Yes, the work of education never stops. It never stops. All right, now what is this? Now, we want to give some great intelligence to this subject of health reform. Because if we're going to properly have revival and reformation, we must give attention to that which we put upon our tables. Now, this is a symbol of healthy food, a symbol of healthy food. Now, we're going to study something called food classification. Now, do you think it's important for us to study nutrition from the Bible standpoint? Yes, it is. All right. Notice what this says from a book called Council on Diet and Foods. Anybody ever heard of Council on Diet and Foods? Who here has actually gone through the book Council on Diet and Foods? By show of hands, who here has at least gone through one book on health from the spirit of prophecy? At least one. Now, brothers and sisters, this is not a means of condemnation, but that is not enough of us. These are the blessed truths that God has given to us, and we need to open up these books, and we must read them. These are not not mere recommendations. These are requirements. This says, in order to know what are the best foods, we must study God's original plan for man's diet. He who created man and who understands his needs appointed Adam his food. Behold, he said, I have given you every herb yielding seed. Now let's get into it. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Genesis. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 1. These were unfortunately some of the very same principles that the children of Israel completely lost sight of. Genesis chapter 11 I mean, chapter 1, rather, starting in verse 11. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his what? After his kind, whose seed is in its what? So did God create any fruit that didn't have seed in it? There's a lesson in that. It says, Upon the earth, and it was what? And it was so. Verse 29, let's jump down to verse 29. The Bible says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for what? For meat. So what was the original meat that God gave to the ancient, uh, gave to Adam and Eve, rather, in the Garden of Eden? Yes, these fruits, these nuts, and these grains. Now again, did God give man a meat diet as far as flesh meat in the Garden of Eden? No, No, he didn't. Because in order to get flesh meat, you would have to do what? Kill. Kill, And killing means death. And was there any death before sin? No. No, there wasn't. All right, so this is a symbol of the herb yielding seed. These are some texts. Now, we're not going to go through all of this, but you can either take a picture or write this down in your notes. This is Matthew 13, Numbers 11, and Numbers chapter 20. That's a symbol of the herb yielding, herb yielding seed. All right, and this is a symbol of the tree. Talking about just about the fruits that grow on trees, this is Ezekiel, Joel, and Deuteronomy. You know, one of the things that sometimes we really don't appreciate is that this, this book is the greatest book on health that has ever been given to humanity. Now, yes, it is very true that a lot of idiosyncrasies are not contained in here, but the Bible gives the greatest skeleton on how to take care of our bodies. Because again, who created the structure that God has given to us? God. So who is best equipped to tell us how to take care of it? God. Now, if we have a car and there is something that goes wrong with the car, say if you have a, a Toyota and you're driving a Toyota, whether a sedan or a SUV, and there's something that goes wrong with the Toyota, do you then go to the Chevy dealership in order to find out how to take care of your Toyota? No, you go to the Toyota dealership. But unfortunately, many times when we have issues or just are trying to take care of the body, we first run to secular science before we consult the Word of God. All right. 
herb yielding seed. This is just the nuts, the seeds, the grains. And this is uh, just an example, figs, peaches, and apples. Now, do these things taste good? They taste very good. They taste very good. <laughs> Everybody get that? All right. This is again from Council on Dine and Foods. This says, upon leaving Eden to gain his livelihood by tilling the earth under the curse of sin, man received permission to eat the flesh of animals. So do you mean to tell me that Adam and Eve were still eating a plant-based diet even after sin entered into the human experience? Yes. yes. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. These food, foods prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength and power of endurance and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. All right, now in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Wardian Genesis. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read in verse 18. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read in verse 18. It says, Storms also and thistles shall it bring forth to what? To thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat what? Bread. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt do what? Thou shalt return. Now, in light of that, this is the herbs of the field. These are some texts that validate this point. This is Genesis 9, 3, 2 Kings 19, and Psalms chapter 104 in verse 14. And this is simply the vegetation. These are the vegetables. Yes, so Adam and Eve were not eating vegetables in the Garden of Eden. Now, vegetables are so potent with nutrients and all of these things, and as a result of that, God gave it to us to eat. Now, naturally, do vegetables, are vegetables very appetizing? No, they're not. Generally speaking, they don't taste very good. And it amazes me sometimes when I see cows and, and rabbits just eating the grass like it tastes good. Grass is nasty. Spinach does not naturally taste good. But are these things good for the body? Yes, they are. So should we eat them? Yes, we should. Exactly. All right. Now we're going to check out after the flood, Genesis chapter 9. Let's turn in our Bible to, to Genesis chapter 9. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Now what happened before Genesis chapter 9? The flood. Now was the flood just, uh, just uh, some nice raindrops that fell and then everything was good? We're told that the flood was so bad that even Satan himself was scared for his own existence. It was that bad. And mind you, Satan is not a human being. He's a spirit. So he can breathe underwater, but even he was afraid that he was going to die. All right, Genesis chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 1. The Bible says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and do what? And replenish the earth. Now, why did he give them this directive? How many people were on the earth at that time? Eight people. Is that a lot of people? No, it's not. It says, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. E even as the green herb have I given you all what? So when did God give man officially permission to subsist upon meat? After the flood. Now why did God give this directive? Yes, because much of the vegetation had been destroyed. Now even after sin, what were the animals still eating? Yes, the grass, the herbs of the field, and all of this. Did li were lions created to eat and hunt gazelle? No, they weren't. 
Were wolves created to do that as well? No, they weren't. They were eating vegetation and all of these things. But after the flood, especially because their habitat was taken, they started to subsist upon meat. Does that make sense? All right. It says, but notice in verse 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not what? So did God ever give man permission to eat meat with blood in it? No, not ever. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Leviticus. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 3, we're going to read in verse 17. Now notice the other injunction. In verse 17, it says, It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your what? That ye eat neither fat nor what? So it wasn't just the blood, but it was no what? No fat. Now, did God, after the flood, did God give man permission to eat whatever animal he wanted to eat? What were the only animals that Noah and his descendants were permitted to eat? Now, how... Now, did uh, Noah and his descendants, did they have an understanding of clean and unclean meat? Where do we get an indication of this? Yes. So the animals that went into the what? So how many of the clean animals went into the ark of that species? Seven. And the unclean by? By two. So did they have a clear understanding of the meat that was clean? and unclean. So did that start with the children of Israel, this concept of clean and unclean meat? No, it didn't. It started all the way back, really principally at the beginning of time. Does that make sense? All right. So it says in verse 17, as we read that you eat neither fat nor fat nor blood. All right. Flesh, every moving thing. Fowl and beef, we get that understanding. It says the question of how to preserve health is one of what importance? Primary. Now, what does that word primary mean? Yes, chief, first. When we study this question in the fear of God, we shall learn that it is best for both our physical and our spiritual advancement to observe simplicity in what? Let us patiently study this what? We need knowledge and judgment in order to move wisely in this what? So should we move in haste when we're studying the principles of our body and how to take care of it? We should study it diligently, very diligently. Nature's laws are not to be resisted, but what? Obey. Those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh foods, tea and coffee and rich and unhealthful preparations, and who are determined to make a covenant with God by self-indulgence. Is that what it says? By sacrifice. Will not continue to indulge their appetite for food that they know to be unhealthful. This is a work that will have to be done after his people can stand before him a perfected people. Before. Not after, but before. All right, now what is this? Anybody know what this is? This is something called pork chops. These are pork chops. Now again, has God given man the permission to eat pork chops? Pork is literally some of the most filthy meat that you can possibly, possibly eat. This says, let the diet reform be what? Progressive. Now, why do you think we're reading so much from the spirit of prophecy? One of the greatest things that Satan has done amongst us as Sydney Adventists is to make us believe that the spirit of prophecy is completely irrelevant. And the, and the most that we do, we'll say, well, Sister White is my favorite author. We merely look at it as devotional reading, but these are required studies. I mean, think about this. If you had to go get surgery by, and you had brain cancer, and you had to go get brain surgery, and as you were getting a consultation by the surgeon, and the surgeon, as you're doing the consultation, the, consulta- uh, the, uh, the surgeon, he said, I just want to let you know off the bat that while I believe in anatomy, I don't believe in physiology. Would you consider him a real surgeon? Now, how is it that some of us can call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists and will say we believe in the commandments of God, but will spurn the testimony of Jesus Christ? 
This is deception. This says, tell them that the time will soon come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter because what? Disease in animals is what? Now, just for context, in principle, when was this statement written? Yes, over a hundred years ago. So if this, if this was saying over a hundred years ago that the time was soon coming, do you think we've come to that time? Yes. Let's turn in our bombs to the book of Hosea. Let's turn in our bombs to the book of Hosea. Let somebody be tempted to believe that this is just the babblings of an old woman. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hosea chapter 4. Let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. The Bible says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the what? Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn and everyone that dwelleth therein shall do what? So the real reason why we have climate change is not merely because of BP and Shell, but is because of the sins of men, our sins. It says, shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be what? So the sins of men have directly affected the animal creation. So the same thing that we just read in the spirit of prophecy is the same thing that the Bible says. Does that make sense? All right. It says the time is near when because of the iniquity of the fallen race, the whole animal creation will groan under the diseases that curse our earth. Has anybody ever watched a documentary on the slaughterhouses and what those animals have to deal with? It is literally satanic. <coughs> Notice, global pork prices rise amid China's pig disease outbreak. This is back from 2019. This says China produces and consumes two-thirds of the world's pork. Is that a lot of pork? That's a lot of pork. All right. Now, somebody says, well, I don't eat pork. I only eat clean meat. Notice, 12 million pounds of beef are recalled for a possible salmonella. Check your freezer. An Arizona-based meat company recalled more than 5.1 million pounds of raw beef. Is that a lot of beef? That's a lot of beef. That's on top of the 6.9 million pounds the company already recalled in October for a total of 12 million. That's the amount of some 55,000 Americans typically eat over a what? So this says that 55,000 of us as Americans eat 12 million pounds of beef, not over a lifetime, but just during one year. Is that a lot of meat? That's a lot of meat. All right. Well, somebody says, well, I don't eat uh, clean meat. I only eat fish. Mercury in fish is more dangerous than believed. Most of the world's fish, especially commercial fish, has mercury in it. And the more they study mercury is the more toxic they realize it to be. Well, somebody says, well, Jesus ate fish. Is that true? Yes, it is very true. But is the fish that Jesus ate the same fish that's rolling around today? And there's also another reason why we shouldn't eat fish. We are currently in something called the Day of Atonement. Who here has ever heard of the Day of Atonement? And because of that reality, these things must be done away. All right, this says the level of mercury in the Pacific Ocean is projected to increase by 50%. By 2050. All right, notice, among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be what? Now, I don't want anyone to feel embarrassed. But again, we're family. We're all 70. Ad now, who here, by show of hands, is not a 70 Adventist? Who here is not a 70 Adventist? So we're all 70 Adventists. By show of hands, who here still eats meat? Don't be ashamed. This is not um, a means of condemnation. 
Yes, fish is, fish is meat. God is good. Does fish have parents? Yes, it does. So, it, so is it meat? It's still meat. Do you have to kill it in order to eat it? Yes, you do. All right. It says, flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily what? Toward it. Now, again, in context, when was this written? Was this written 15 years ago? Now, brothers and sisters, in principle, there should be none of us as Seventh-day Adventists eating meat. Now, back home, uh, where I'm from in New Jersey, I, even though I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist, I grew up thinking that the full crumb of the health message was merely that we didn't eat pork and shrimp and all this. And, you know, my father's guy and he's, you know, so I grew up in a Caribbean church, just like this wonderful church here. And the proper aspects of health reform were something that we never talked about, ever. Brothers and sisters, this health reform message is progressive. And God is calling us to follow in the light. All right. It says, all who are connected with our health institutions especially should be, be educating themselves to subsist on fruits, grains, and what? And vegetables. If we move from principle in these things, if we as Christian reformers educate our own taste and bring our diet to God's plan that we may exert an influence upon others in this matter, which will be pleasing to God. Now, notice this statement. Greater reform should be seen among the people who claim to be looking for the soon appearing of Christ. There are those who ought to be awake to the danger of meat eating, who are still eating the flesh of animals, thus endangering physical, mental, and spiritual health. Notice, many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more what? So this is not saying that God is going to be forcing anyone out, but because of what eating the meat does to the mind and spirituality, persons will voluntarily leave this movement. Does that make sense? Because this is just a, a simple question. If God is telling us to come up higher upon health reform and he's there to give us the grace and he's encouraging us to do this, and we're unwilling to make these sacrifices in what we eat, what makes us think that we're going to be willing to sacrifice our entire lives to lay down our life for him? It makes no sense. Notice, anybody uh, know what this is? These are actually pancakes that are completely plant-based. Does this, does this look good? This looks super good. What about this? Does this look good? Yeah. All plant-based. What about this? Does this look good? All plant-based. Does this look good? Yes, all plant-based. Does this look good too? Again, all plant-based. Just because we give up all of these hurtful articles of food does not mean that we have to uh, uh, subsist upon an impoverished diet. We can still eat food that tastes super good. All right. Interest in veganism is what? Again, the world is running away with this concept of a plant-based diet. All right. Skip past this. All right. Notice this article from the New York Post runner. My superpower vegan diet helped me to smash record. The ultra runner Robbie Ballinger doesn't stop. The vegan athlete's 100% plant-based diet gave him superpower stamina to set a new record for running the most laps around Central Park in less than 24 hours. These 19 ath elite athletes are vegan. Here's what made them switch their diet again. One of the things that I said all the time when you're thinking about adopting a plant-based diet is how are you going to get your protein? Now, is it necessary for you to eat meat in order to get protein? No, almost everything we eat has protein. Notice, from a healthy uh, decrease in cholesterol, blood pressure, and heart disease risk to weight loss, there seem to be plenty of health benefits to ditching dairy, meat, and eggs. Get past. Venus Williams. Anybody ever heard of Venus Williams? Completely plant-based. 
Anybody ever heard of a man named Lewis Hamilton? He races for Formula One, completely plant-based. Anybody ever heard of Kyrie Irving? Completely plant-based. Anybody ever heard of David Hay? Maybe not. Boxing, completely plant-based. So I believe we get the point. Notice, again, Council on Diet and Foods. It is a mistake to suppose that muscular strength depends on the use of animal food. The grains with the fruits, nuts, and vegetables contain all the nutritive properties necessary to make good blood. This says uh, these elements are not so well or so fully supplied by the flesh diet. All right. God gave our first parents the food he designed that the race should eat. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. There was to be no death in where? In Eden. And again, when we get to heaven, are we going to be barbecuing uh, chicken and, and fish and beef and all that? No, we're not. God gave man no permission to eat animal food until what? Until after the flood. Again, let them learn how to live healthfully, teaching others what they have learned. Let them impart this knowledge as they would want. Especially as we seek to do evangelism and reach our community, we must elevate this message of health. We are told very clearly in the spirit of prophecy that this health work is the entering wedge to give the gospel. Because if you are ministering to persons who have diabetes and high blood pressure, and you can help them with these maladies, do you think that this is going to open their hearts to Christ? Yes, but unfortunately, if we are suffering from the same issues that they are, is this really going to be an opening wedge? No, it is not. All right, it says, let them teach the people to preserve their health and increase the strength by avoiding, notice, the large amount of cooking that has filled the world with what? With chronic invalids. It's not only just eating plant-based food, but we also need to eat very fresh food. And especially amongst those of us that are Caribbean, we eat a lot of cooked food. A lot of cooked food. We need to eat a lot of fresh vegetables and a lot of fresh uh, fruits. All right. By precept and example, make it plain that the food which God gave Adam in his sinless state is the best for man's use as he seeks to, to regain that sinless state. All right. Now, when you see this picture, what comes to your imagination? We're bringing this to a close. Now, contrary to popular opinion, our health is not wholly dependent upon what we eat. Health is holistic. Now, we don't have time to talk about all the laws of health. It would take too much time. But one of the most neglected laws of health that we have is daily exercise. Now, d please don't be ashamed. By show of hands, who here exercises on a daily basis? Now, brothers and sisters, again, this is not a means of condemnation, but the very law of our body is motion, is motion. All right. The top 10 benefits of regular exercise. It can make you feel happier. Does it help to make you feel happier? Yes. It can help with weight loss. It is good for your muscles and bones. Oh, pardon? It can help your brain health and your memory. Who here feels that they struggle with their memory? Yes, we need to exercise more. All right, it can help with relaxation and sleep quality. Who here feels that they get good sleep? Only a few of us. All right, notice, notice this, this is scary. Only 23% of the U.S. adults are getting enough exercise. 23%. Just 23. Now, what is the best form of exercise? Walking. Now, who here, by show of hands, can walk? Now, do you need to pay a gym membership to walk? No, it's completely free. Brothers and sisters, this is something simple that we can do every day. I promise if you incorporate at least 30 minutes of walking every day into your regimen, I can promise you, you will see the benefits. 
at least 30 minutes. All right. Anybody know who these people are? Notice. This says, this main people, indigenous Bolivian group, have world's healthiest arteries. I wonder why. Notice. This says the people with the healthiest hearts in the world are the Tismane people of Bolivia, researchers reported Friday. That should really say Seventh-day Adventist, but why do you think it doesn't say Seventh-day Adventist? Because we're not practicing these simple principles. Notice. Yes. It says the people in Bolivia have the healthiest hearts in the world, live on a tributary of the Amazon uh, River of Bolivia. Notice. The people walk, ride bikes, and canoe where? Everywhere. Their staple foods are homegrown rice, plantains, and what? If they eat meat, they do what? Do they get it from Walmart? And they don't do what? They don't watch television. Do you think that television is helping to make us unhealthy? Oh, yes, it is. We get the Lay's potato chips and the Cheetos and Doritos, and we watch Netflix. All right. This says the only hope of better things is the education of the people in what? Notice this. Actually, let's all read this together. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of what? So in light of that, is, is disease a good thing or a bad thing? It's actually a good thing. Disease actually tells us that there is something wrong with our bodies. Now, when you are driving down the street and the check engine light comes on, is it a bad thing that the check engine light comes on? Or would you have it that your engine be breaking down and the light never come on? Which one would you rather have? The light to come on. So when we get diabetes, this is actually the body saying, there's something wrong with me. When we get cancer, this is the body saying that there is something wrong with me that you need to fix. That makes sense. Now, who can fix it? Can the doctor fix it? Do doctors bring healing? Do even using natural remedies bring healing? Who brings healing? Christ. But can he use the natural remedies and healthy eating and the lifestyle? Yes, he can. But the healing comes from Christ. Notice, in case of sickness, we should run to a natural remedy. Is that what it says? The cause should be ascertained. When we first get sick, we should find out why we got sick. So when we get a common cold, we shouldn't run to Golden Seal first. We should find out if we have been staying up late too much. If we haven't been drinking enough water or getting enough exercise, if we're stressed out, we need to find out why we got sick. Yes, unhelpful conditions should be changed and wrong habits what? Because many times when we get sick, we just want God to take care of the symptoms, but we don't want him to deal with the cause. It says, then, it says, then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the what? Do you know that during Christ's whole life on earth that Jesus literally never got sick? Not once. Not, not a single time. All right, now what is this? This is our last, last point. What is this? This is a symbol of the three angels' messages. Are these messages powerful? Where are they located in the Word of God? Revelation 14. Health. Notice, the principles of health reform are found in where? The Word of God. The gospel of health is, is to be firmly linked with the ministry of the what? The ministry of the Word. It is the Lord's design that the restoring influence of health reform shall be a part of the last great efforts to proclaim the gospel message. Notice, this is taken from an outlet called The Economist. Now, is The, is the Economist a Christian outlet? Are they trying to spread the three angels' messages? No, they're not. Notice, Christian Californians may have a solution to America's obesity. This is written in 2023. Now, what group of Christians do you think The Economist is referring to? Seventh-day Adventists. At 96 years old, Paul Damaso still works nine hours, nine-hour days, six days a week. Is that serious? 
The man is almost a hundred years old, still working a regular, regular job. Notice, he has a recurring spot on a radio show and occasionally appears on television. Mr. Damaso is a seven-day Adventist, a what? Are we Protestants? Should we be proud of it? Yes. A Protestant denomination that observes the Sabbath on Saturday and hopes for the eminent second coming of what? In the mid-19th century, one of its prophets and founders, Ellen White, had a vision. I don't know what other prophets he's referring to. She and her brethren should eat food as it grows out of the ground, the vision said. They must also be mindful of animal products and avoid smoking and wear. So if we're not going to preach this message, we'll have the economists do it. Seventh-day Adventists believe that God made the body as a temple to hold the what? The soul. By some accounts, Seventh-day Adventists are the healthiest people in America. They have lower rates of cancer, a longer life expectancy, and better physical and mental health throughout their lives. Brothers and sisters, do you think that it's time to truly practice these principles? Because again, if we really want revival and reformation, we cannot put these things to the background and still believe that God's going to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us. If we think that, we're only deceiving ourselves. We're only deceiving ourselves, and especially at this time. Brothers and sisters, God means every single thing that he says. Every single thing. If we continue in this, unfortunately, though God loves us, we may just have to suffer the consequences of our disobedience. But God does promise that we, if we follow him in faith, that he will put none of the diseases upon us as were put upon the Egyptians. Now, very small appeal again, by show of hands, who wants to be a part of that number to follow the Lord, especially in the year of health? Amen. And in light of that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the principles of health and form. Lord, I just pray that you would be with each and every one of us, for the health of form is progressive and we can never say that we have come to a place where we have attained. But I just pray, dear Lord, that you would strengthen our hearts. I pray that we will pray for and encourage one another, especially those of us uh, here, dear Lord, that are still subsisting upon a meat diet. I just pray that you would help us to encourage one another to come up higher, dear Lord, that we will seek to do as much as we can to ensure that we all are prospering and in health even as our soul is prospering. Lord, we consecrate ourselves to you this Sabbath. We pray to follow you all the way, and we pray that you would keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen.